presentation. Um, Michelle has been such a great host. We're looking forward to working with her in Canada and, and her ideas and, and the way we can actually look at, at changing uh, Canada, right? A bit more and, and, and making it a, a better place for everyone. So Michelle, thank you for being here in Berlin. Um, we love the fact that we can see you very clearly. I will have to talk to you from the, um, here, the laptop, but please, <laughs> round of applause for Michelle. Thank you so much for uh, facilitating my remote appearance. We're uh, actually in the middle of a couple of uh, sort of major national crises right now. So I wanted to come out very badly uh, because I'm really excited about what you guys are doing. So thank you so much for letting me do my job and present here today. So um, I'm always interested in who's talking to me. So I'll very quickly give you a bit of my background and um, why I'm interested in being here today. Um, so I'm, I'm 39 years old, so I'm notionally a millennial. Uh, my background's in economics and intellectual property management. And as was mentioned, I'm just entering my third term in parliament. Um, I've served in the executive branch as an economic minister. I've also served as a, a senior official in our environment ministry. Um, as well as our vice chair for our House Committee on Immigration. Um, in terms of politics and political strife, um, I, I, would, I deeply care about social inequality. Uh, you know, I, I see healthcare as a public good. Um, I understand the severity and the me immediacy of the problem of climate change. I am in no way a theocrat, but, and here's where you all will gasp, I am a conservative politician and I represent an oil producing region in Canada. So I think I'm here today as a conservative politician talking to a group called Radical Exchange full of green and internationalists uh, talking about public goods beyond nation state because I think Glenn wanted me to make you guys a bit uncomfortable, which I plan to do. Um, but I'm also here to uh, fulfill my mandate and serve my community uh, which is why I need to be part of the solutions that you're developing. So uh, to answer why I'm here, in, in addition to that, is it's actually a similar question to one I was asked yesterday, and that was uh, what keeps me up at night. And so in the last several years in Canada, in my term as a legislator, I've noticed that many significant public policy challenges that are common to us across the world, that they can't be solved at the nation state level. You know this, this is not shocking. Uh, you know, be it climate change, the migration crisis, um, societal impacts uh, of changes from a labor-based economy to a data-based economy. All of these problems require global solutions to address, and yet many of our global institutions, uh, of which many of which are simply extensions of our current nation state systems, have become, they've come under fire for bloatedness or ineffectuality. And, and, and frankly, having interacted with many of these multilateral organizations, uh, you know, I think that that criticism in, in some instances is certainly correct. So at the same time, while we're talking about global solutions, um, it's the individual that is the one that's stuck with living with the consequences of these crises. So be it, uh, you know, if the individual is an ethnic minority woman in Northern Iraq who's been displaced by conflict, or an Italian farmer who can't sell her goods anymore, or a retired US Army reservist in Oklahoma who can't find a job. Um, these are individuals, and individuals are also you and I who are, you know, we all are wearing the baggage of our cultural context, uh, as well as our privileges or lack thereof, uh, as, as we talk about solutions to these problems. So to a policy maker, what keeps me up at night is knowing that any global systems change developed by cultural elites like us that does not acknowledge the cultural context, the needs and the needs of a particular individual will inadvertently create nationalistic or populist movements, which in turn are the antithesis of what we need as a global community to move forward. So in short, all politics are global, but all politics are simultaneously deeply local and individual. So before I start talking about how we can solve this problem and tie it into what um, Radical Exchange is doing, I'd like to give you a case study from the Canadian context 
that is personal to me. And I think this will be the deeply uncomfortable part that I mentioned. So I represent a riding uh, in, in Alberta, which is Western Canada, for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, and what we do in Alberta is we produce fossil fuels. Um, we have one of the biggest uh, oil reserves, unconventional oil reserves in the world. And, uh, you know, over the last several decades, um, you know, sort of the inconvenient truth for Canada is that a majority of our wealth is produced and generated by the energy sector. Um, so certainly my province has been quite prosperous in, in, in recent decades. And uh, what, th there are certain challenges to growth of our sector, and I'll talk about climate in a moment, but part of the problem is, is that we're landlocked. So in order to get our product to market, uh, we have to transport it via pipeline. And right now, the only market that buys our product directly, our unrefined product, is the United States, which means that we're price takers, not price makers. And there's a lot of wealth that's generated in the United States by taking or giving Canadian oil a price that is lower than world market price, and the profit is made on the differential. So there's, uh, there's always been an existing um, irritant in the Canadian economy around the fact that we don't see the benefit of that delta. Now, what's happened in the last several years is that the Canadian government has changed the regulatory framework for review of energy infrastructure projects, such as pipelines, as well as any expansion of the energy sector, um, in order to do two things, review the downstream emission profile of any oil that is produced in the, in the Canadian energy sector, and the second thing is to change the rules so that, broadly speaking, uh, in terms of environmental review process, rather than a de clearly defined timeline where you get to either to a no or a yes, that timeline doesn't exist anymore. So what this has done is destabilize the investment uh, capacity for the Canadian energy sector. And uh, that investment capital has gone to other jurisdictions where the regulatory framework isn't as strict. And what that has resulted in is that our product, which you know arguably is produced under higher environmental and ethical standards than other jurisdictions in the world, has been displaced to the point where we're importing Saudi and Venezuelan oil to meet our energy demands. So in a country like Canada where it's cold and we're geographically sparse and we're a natural resource-based economy, this has created a significant economic downturn in my province to the point where uh, my riding was at the natural rate of unemployment about four years ago and is now the highest unemployment rate in the country. So what that has meant, practically speaking, is that um, my riding has gone through a significant, uh, we've lost our tax base, so there's uh, significant property tax increases. Um, many people have lost their jobs, losing their homes. Our suicide rate has increased significantly. It's now at the, some of the highest levels in the country. Um, I have calls into my office about women who are prostituting themselves because their husbands are out of work. And um, it's, it, it has been a big and significant economic upheaval. And the sense is that it's largely preventable because the policies that have been put forward by Ottawa has made us, our, our industry, uncompetitive. So that, that enters the question of climate change. Look, how do we, how do we transition from a, a, a fossil fuel-based economy to one where uh, we have prosperity that doesn't necessarily come from that, that industry? That question has not been adequately addressed by the international community or frankly by our national government. And to the point now where my province is actually looking at a significant and well-funded successionist movement. We are facing a national unity crisis in Canada. It might not have hit international news yet, but that's where we're at. And it's been large, and it's not that my people in my riding don't care about climate change, they do. Um, there's many people who are in Employed in clean energy jobs, we have a you know significant sector that looks at ways of producing fossil fuels in a transition period in a cleaner, more environmentally responsible way. It's the individual in my riding, the individual 
doesn't understand the hypocrisy of people in Eastern Canada saying that they should bear the brunt of climate change policy because somebody in downtown Toronto is benefiting from a program called equalization payments where my province actually subsidizes most of the country's uh, non-national level government. And also, frankly, somebody who is filling up their Humvee with a uh, tank of gas that's been produced in Saudi Arabia, drinking a kale smoothie whose component parts have been imported from California, and then is looking at somebody in my riding, and this is what they say, this is what's in the national news, what you do is dirty, and you shouldn't have the right to work. All politics are international. The question of climate change needs to be addressed both domestically and internationally, but they're also local. And if we're not getting that individual perspective, you end up getting conflict, successionist movements, and worse, loss of social license to deal with problems that significantly impact the global community. And I share with you that example because we haven't done a good job of this in Canada and we're often, you know, the Pollyanna state, like, oh, Canada, we're great, hey? Not the case. Uh, we have not done this well. And uh, I think we need, to, we, we need to look to what you are doing in order to address some of these challenges. The question is, how do you, we do what you're doing while addressing this core problem between uh, the needs of the individual, nation state politics, and new international systems. So I want to be very clear, I'm not making a case for the status quo. Uh, what I'm saying is to actually implement what you at Radical Exchange want to do. The challenge is to recognize the needs of the individuals and use existing systems to revitalize our government systems. So to further this argument across the world, left of center movements have become increasingly simultaneously global and more statist in terms of offering solutions to address inequalities of individuals within their borders. Within the context of major world democracies, however, unsustainable high levels of deficit spending, especially to support foreign initiatives, could create long-term solvency issues for major world economies, more ubiquitousness of government, and less individual freedom. At the same time, many right-of-center movements have become increasingly more nationalistic and theocratic and have lost back positions on support for free trade, international aid, and immigration in response to the left-wing movements. Within the context of my country, certainly, neither of these options are particularly palatable, and the outcome of our most recent federal election, which just concluded a few short weeks ago, with the Trudeau Liberals being reduced to a minority, but my party failing to win the election, is an example of this. I, this is going to be very controversial, and I'm sure it will be clipped in my national media, but nobody in my country, outside of perhaps the those who voted for the Successionist Party in Quebec, were particularly excited about voting for any political party. So given these trends, I believe that people around the world are looking for what I would term as a new international center for politics. Uh, there are nascent new centrist movements emerging in Europe, especially in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Holland, France, and even the United Kingdom. And these movements are led by the growth of green and liberal parties that are increasingly looking to dominate the politics of younger generations, as they should. And whatever the differences, these parties look to social and technological change and international cooperation as the core elements of their identity. That said, electoral breakthroughs have been slim and might charitably be attributed to protest voting. These types of gains are not sustainable. And right now, such sentiments will only speak to at most a third of the population, even in the countries where they've been most successful. And the reason for this, I believe, is obvious. National politics are about national interests. So the international centrist movement has not yet been able to figure out how to be relatable to the interests of the individual or gain the trust of the <laughs> You know, there's nothing more fitting than this happening at a tech conference, right? Like, anyway, I, I digress. Okay, I'll get back to my dry, boring academic speech about uh, nationalist politics. So. Where were we at? We were talking about um, movements 
uh, that are happening in, um, uh, in in other parts of the world. And it's this new international center that I really think needs to come forward. The problem is, I just don't think that um, right now that movement is capturing the imagination of the individual, right? And that there's, a, it, it, there's this, what I feel is that there's this distrust within the individual at the electorate level that feels like this is just another status movement. Um, and, and I think in order for us to really look at this type of politics or policy, which is really rooted in what you are trying to do, we need to figure out how to make it relevant to the individual. And uh, so you guys are facing a related challenge that I am. Uh, you know, I call myself, I, I'm part of the Conservative Party of Canada, but I would consider myself a centrist in terms of many international political movements. Um, you guys are looking at a future of political economy that's beyond the nation state structure. But that can't just, you know, magically emerge or be imposed from the top down first, because there's no one to do that. And thankfully, because those who have fled or understand the ramifications of brutal state-run regimes wouldn't want to if we could. There's a natural skepticism to the imposition of new forms of governance that aren't understandable or appear like they're trying to consolidate or remove power from an individual. So what I'm trying to say is that in order for us to move forward, we need to win the game as it's currently being played. And that's via international capitalism and nation state politics. And given the challenges and problems with each, I don't think we can afford to lose. What I want to try and convince you of today is that a new center must speak first to the national issue while at the same time providing bold new approaches to policy that first and foremost create widely shared national prosperity and yet simultaneously build international cooperation. Um, you know, the ideas that you are discussing here could constrain the worst excesses of corporate power in a way that is both effective and doesn't rely heavily on nation states and foster affinities and policy coordinations across otherwise competing countries while appealing to national majorities. And the systems that you're looking at, I think, are the nat natural uh, answer to the question of how do we make multilateralism work? Uh, when we've seen multilateral organizations that were built in the post-war era fail. So in short, by carefully building new centrist national majorities, by focusing at the nation state level, movements like radical exchange can set the a stage for unprecedented support for the concept of international public goods. To do so, however, everyone needs to get past any queasiness of national majoritarian politics and any penchant for statist or state-run solutions. If I were an individual in any national context, you need to be able to show me, the average individual, that your program means a happier, prouder, and more prosperous future for me in order for me to trust you with power and reject a nationalist or theocratic or statist movement. You can't tell me that I'm dumb that I'm a deplorable because I don't have your privilege or that I'm interested in ensuring that I have a steady source of income or that I want to retain my cultural identity. Bluntly put, movements collapse when pursuing worthy causes of global concern when they offer what little tangible or direct benefit to an individual. And an individual needs to be able to see themselves directly reflected in any movement. As an example, uh, current successful global or uh, multinational institutions have their roots in preventing discernible and immediate warfare. However, since the global community is now several generations removed from the last global conflict, this motivation is not relevant to people in major democracies who have never experienced living under the direct threat of conflict. And I think, you know, I would use the EU and uh, Brexit as an example of this. Um, I would say I'm an apologist for the European Union because it's an institution that has prevented uh, warfare for many decades on a continent that has historically throughout the history of our species been at war. And as somebody who has been in the executive branch of government, I understand that there is a cost to prosperity and stability, or st to, pros uh, to stability, and that is ensuring that the population of an area, or in this case Europe, 
has access to prosperity and economic growth. Because when people are producing something and have access to stability and income, they don't want to fight each other, right? But we've kind of moved away from, there's, you know, generations that are my contemporaries that can't, in Canada that can't contextualize war. And I know that that is a very, you know, Canadian uh, privileged position to have, but I do think that uh, it's at the heart of where nationalist movements um, get traction, right? Um, more examples, um, citizens might be open to migration that clearly benefits them, but not excited about receiving large numbers of refugees without a clearly financed plan to support integration within their borders. They may be persuaded to play a part in addressing climate change if other companies act in concert, but in especially like a cold place like Canada, people balk at making significant individual economic sacrifices. The same can be said for paying more towards research and development funds for prescription drugs, open, uh, supporting open source software using around the globe and so forth. Similarly, if the benefits of trade and other international cooperation are not clearly improving the lives of typical citizens, they will fall prey to protectionist sentiment. The bottom line is that, the is that national politics must clearly lead with advancing the interests of typical voters rather than what they see as worthy but distant causes. This does not preclude significant scope for policies that addresses pressing problems of a particular concern using mechanisms that are most effective when pursued in a controlled and parallel way across countries. This is particularly true if such policies empower civil society and local entrepreneurs at the expense of concentrated power, whether corporate or nation state. Many of radical exchanges, nearer term, large scale policy initiatives uh, fit clearly into this camp and that's why they're exciting. For example, um, what has been compelling to me is uh, radical exchanges work on internationally coordinated framework for data governance um, I'm just going to, you know, back up here with a personal anecdote. I'm sure you all watched the um, Zuckerberg Senate testimony last year in, in the U.S. As a legislator, I watched that and just, like, it's just this perfect example of how um, our, our current legislative systems in many democracies actually don't even have the nimbleness or capacity to deal with the data economy in any particularly meaningful way. So the Data Reform Act that Max presented at your conference reads as a fair and empowering fr framework that could stimulate new lo local entrepreneurs um, in, as well as it does in my riding as it, as it would in San Francisco. Um, your antitrust framework may not be quite as popular as they could be if combi combined with the rhetoric of industrial policy to support national champions, but they strike at many of the forms of concentrated power the public is rightly uneasy about such as the financial sector and power over workers, effectively enough that they are still big wins politically. Similarly, the ideas you are discussing look at ways and offer ways to break down political power that is often hoarded or consolidated with barriers such as unrestricted ability for corporations, wealthy individuals and lobbyists to influence the decision making process with political financial contributions. Uh, even more interesting to me is how to use bolder and more transformative ideas like quadratic voting, quadratic finance, and intersectional social data. The tension, however, is clear in that a lot of rhetoric around quadratic finance focuses on facilitating collaboration among groups that don't necessarily clear li clearly line up with national borders, whether environmental features or software projects, yet a government unilaterally pouring money into subsidizing such a scheme would inevitably at present seem to be subsidizing foreigners. So there's, I think there's a saving grace here for you to consider. Um, some of the ideas that you are discussing can be used to encourage public good creation within any group of people. Applied globally, they would tend to break down divisions across nations while respecting cultural uh, distinctions and context. So the individual is still brought into the picture. Yet the organization of the world is not about nations and the world, it's about different levels of governance in organizations, neighborhoods within cities, within provinces, within nations around the world, cross-cut by corporations, NGOs, religious organizations, ethno-racial groups, linguistic groups, groups, and so on. Encouraging cooperation within a country between these social divisions will tend to improve the lives of typical people in those countries, 
even if outsiders are excluded from these schemes or only included at some significant cost that accrues to citizens. Just as corporations can profit by creating productive platforms for which they then change, nations can enrich their citizens by growing in, in, internally more productive while cha charging access for others. So the ideas that you're discussing are what I would classify, and I think we need to start using terms like this, smart patriotism. And they could be the start of sustainable, uh, a sustainable new international centrist movement. And it's no surprise, therefore, that so many diverse political parties are attracted to them. So how do we move forward? I think we need to use these observations to begin to paint a picture of coherent, a coherent joint strategy for a national centrist movement in which political parties who align begin to win at a national level, defend the rights and interests of the individual, and in the process, build a more vibrant basis for international cooperation. Parallel antitrust and data empowerment frameworks could begin to tame the worst excesses of international oligopolies that have created a widespread sense of hostility to global elites. And critically, they can do so in a way that gain majority support in a variety of countries, foster communication and cooperation across those countries, and avoid fights over national champions and the division of tax rates across jurisdictions. This could serve as the basis of making inter and the international economic system far more widely acceptable and legitimate to the interests of the individual. Uh, there are, you know, I've got more notes here. There's, there's examples on, on how we can build on this. I do think there's some best practice, um, but I, I'm speaking to you today because I'm looking to you and your movement to tell me why I should stay in politics. Um, I've got the needs of a community that I need to advocate for. I think public service is worthy. But it's very frustrating to watch the, um, the need for international cooperation to be co-opted into a, a almost caricature right-wing, left-wing debate for which there's no home for you know, an alternative school of thought that is both fiscally responsible, um, acknowledges the individual right, uh, need for individual rights and freedoms, and yet also looks towards uh, solutions that require an international response. Um, you know, I've been in parliament, I was elected in 2011, and I, I, it's been really interesting. I don't, I, I, I'm not sure anyone, you know, outside of periods of conflict, any legislator around the world could have lived through a more um, changed time in terms of how legislatures work and how politics work. I mean, when I started in 2011, um, Twitter wasn't a thing, and now we have major world leaders making policy on Twitter, right? Uh, and I think that um, in, in a world where the way to, to, the perceived way to gain the support of the electorate is, you know, to be bombastic, and I'm guilty of this too, uh, in 140 character sound bites, you know, the, the real question is how do we adopt what you're talking about in that context and then reject the systems that are emerging that are more polarized? And I think that what you are putting here together here has the potential to do it. But there needs to be a political vehicle to do that as well. And that's what I task you with. Um, and I think that there are many people, if you're sitting in here at the audience today and you have legislative capacity, that's what I hope that you're looking at too, to look for allies in unlikely places. If you are a deep, dark socialist, um, I want to talk to you, even though you might not want to talk to me. We might not agree on policy on the forefront, but we need to agree that democratic institutions and international cooperation needs a rethink in terms of how we make them sustainable going forward. And uh, I think that, you know, just speaking to my national context in Canada, especially after the last election uh, that we just went through that I'm still decompressing from, we have to do it. Um, otherwise, I, I really worry about successionist movements, nationalist movements, uh, being the, the, the logical home for people who are wanting a change because they don't see themselves reflected in what we're talking about here. So I'll close and just say um, I'm hopeful. I, I do think that uh, uh, the stuff that you're doing, even though I try to explain it to people and their eyes glaze over, um, can be translated into something that is doable. But the, the, the question for you that I just urge you not to lose sight of is implementation at an individual level. And with that, before I get cut, cut off of this Zoom meeting once again, I thank you for your time and I hope you will come to Canada and uh, have a conference here.
Thank you, Michelle. That was awesome. Thank you so much.